Chapter 7 of My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass Narrated by Gregicator Life in the Great House List of Chapter Topics Comforts and Luxuries Elaborate Expenditure House Servants Men Servants and Maid Servants Appearances Slave Aristocracy Stable and Carriage House Boundless Hospitality Fragrance of Rich Dishes, The Deceptive Character of Slavery, Slaves Seem Happy, Slaves and Slaveholders Alike Wretched, Fretful Discontent of Slaveholders, Fault Finding, Old Barney, His Profession, Whipping, Humiliating Spectacle, Case Exceptional, William Wilkes, Supposed Son of Colonel Lloyd, Curious incident, slaves prefer rich masters to poor ones. The close-fisted stinginess that fed the poor slave on coarse cornmeal and tainted meat, that clothed him in crashy tow linen, and hurried him on to toil through the field in all weathers, with wind and rain beating through his tattered garments, that scarcely gave even the young slave mother time to nurse her hungry infant in the fence corner, wholly vanishes on approaching the sacred precincts of the great house, the home of the Lloyds. There the scriptural phrase finds an exact illustration. The highly favored inmates of this mansion are literally arrayed in purple and fine linen and fare sumptuously every day. The table groans under the heavy and blood-bought luxuries gathered with painstaking care at home and abroad. Fields, forests, rivers, and seas are made tributary here. Immense wealth and its lavish expenditure fill the great house with all that can please the eye or tempt the taste. Here, appetite, not food, is the great desideratum. Fish, flesh, and fowl are here in profusion. Chickens of all breeds, ducks of all kinds, wild and tame, the common and the huge muscovite. Guinea fowls, turkeys, geese, and pea fowls are in their several pens, fat and fatting for the destined vortex. The graceful swan, the mongrels, the black-necked wild goose, partridges, quails, pheasants, and pigeons, choice waterfowl with all their strange varieties, are caught in this huge family net. Beef, veal, mutton, and venison of the most select kinds and quality roll bounteously to this grand consumer. The teeming riches of the Chesapeake Bay, its rock, perch, drums, crocus, trout, oysters, crabs, and terrapin are drawn hither to adorn the glittering table of the great house. The dairy, too, probably the finest on the eastern shore of Maryland, supplied by cattle of the best English stock, imported for the purpose, pours its rich donations of fragrant cheese, golden butter, and delicious cream to heighten the attraction of the gorgeous, unending round of feasting nor are the fruits of the earth forgotten or neglected. The gardener, imported from Scotland, a Mr. McDermott, with four men under his direction, was not behind, either in the abundance or in the delicacy of its contributions to the same full board. The tender asparagus, the succulent celery, and the delicate cauliflower, eggplants, beets, lettuce, parsnips, Peas and French beans early and late, radishes, cantaloupes, melons of all kinds, the fruits and flowers of all climes and of all descriptions, from the hardy apple of the north to the lemon and orange of the south, culminated at this point. Baltimore gathered figs, raisins, almonds, and juicy grapes from Spain, wines and brandies from France, teas of various flavor from China, and rich aromatic coffee from Java, all conspired to swell the tide of high life, where pride and indolence rolled and lounged in magnificence and satiety.
Behind the tall-backed and elaborately wrought chairs stand the servants, men and maidens, fifteen in number, discriminately selected, not only with a view to their industry and faithfulness, but with special regard to their personal appearance, their graceful agility and captivating address. Some of these are armed with fans and are fanning reviving breezes toward the overheated brows of the alabaster ladies. Others watch with eager eye and with fawn-like step anticipate and supply wants before they are sufficiently formed to be announced by word or sign. These servants constituted a sort of black aristocracy on Colonel Lloyd's plantation. They resembled the field hands in nothing, except in color, and in this they held the advantage of a velvet-like glossiness, rich and beautiful. The hair, too, showed the same advantage. The delicate colored maid rustled in the scarcely worn silk of her young mistress, while the servant men were equally well attired from the overflowing wardrobe of their young masters, so that in dress as well as in form and feature, in manner and speech, in tastes and habits, the distance between these favored few and the sorrow and hunger smitten multitudes of the quarter and the field was immense, and this is seldom passed over. Let us now glance at the stables and the carriage house, and we shall find the same evidences of pride and luxurious extravagance. Here are three splendid coaches, soft within and lustrous without. Here, too, are gigs, phaetons, barouches, sulkies, and sleighs. Here are saddles and harnesses, beautifully wrought and silver-mounted, kept with every care. In the stable you will find, kept only for pleasure, full thirty-five horses of the most approved blood for speed and beauty. There are two men here constantly employed in taking care of these horses. One of these men must always be in the stable to answer every call from the great house. Over the way from the stable is a house built expressly for the hounds, a pack of twenty-five or thirty, whose fare would have made glad the heart of a dozen slaves. Horses and hounds are not the only consumers of the slave's toil. There was practiced, at the Lloyd's, a hospitality which would have astonished and charmed any health-seeking northern divine or merchant who might have chanced to share it. Viewed from his own table and not from the field, the colonel was a model of generous hospitality. His house was literally a hotel for weeks during the summer months. At these times, especially, the air was freighted with the rich fumes of baking, boiling, roasting, and broiling. The odors I shared with the winds, but the meats were under a more stringent monopoly, except that occasionally I got a cake from Mass Daniel. In Mass Daniel, I had a friend at court from whom I learned many things which my eager curiosity was excited to know. I always knew when company was expected and who they were, although I was an outsider, being the property not of Colonel Lloyd, but of a servant of the wealthy colonel. On these occasions, all that pride, taste, and money could do to dazzle and charm was done. Who could say that the servants of Colonel Lloyd were not well clad and cared for after witnessing one of his magnificent entertainments? Who could say that they did not seem to glory in being the slaves of such a master? Who, but a fanatic, could get up any sympathy for persons whose every movement was agile, easy, and graceful, and who evinced a consciousness of high superiority? And who would ever venture to suspect that Colonel Lloyd was subject to the troubles of ordinary mortals? Master and slave seem alike in their glory here. Can it all be seeming? Alas, it may only be a sham at last. This immense wealth, this gilded splendor, this profusion of luxury, this exemption from toil, this life of ease, 
this sea of plenty, I, what of it all? Are the pearly gates of happiness and sweet content flung open to such suitors? Far from it. The poor slave on his hard pine plank, but scantily covered with his thin blanket, sleeps more soundly than the feverish voluptuary who reclines upon his feather bed and downy pillow. Food to the indolent lounger is poison, not sustenance. Lurking beneath all their dishes are invisible spirits of evil, ready to feed the self-deluded gormandizers with aches, pains, fierce temper, uncontrolled passions, dyspepsia, rheumatism, lumbago, and gout, and of these the Lloyds get their full share. To the pampered love of ease there is no resting place. What is pleasant today is repulsive tomorrow. What is soft now is hard at another time. What is sweet in the morning is bitter in the evening. Neither to the wicked nor to the idler is there any solid peace, troubled like the restless sea. I had excellent opportunities of witnessing the restless discontent and the capricious irritation of the Lloyds. My fondness for horses, not peculiar to me more than to other boys, attracted me much of the time to the stables. This establishment was especially under the care of old and young Barney, father and son. Old Barney was a fine-looking old man, of a brownish complexion, who was quite portly and wore a dignified aspect for a slave. He was evidently much devoted to his profession, and held his office an honorable one. He was a farrier, as well as an ostler. He could bleed, remove lampers from the mouths of the horses, and was well instructed in horse medicines. No one on the farm knew, so well as old Barney, what to do with a sick horse. But his gifts and acquirements were of little advantage to him. His office was by no means an enviable one. He often got presents, but he got stripes as well, for in nothing was Colonel Lloyd more unreasonable and exacting than in respect to the management of his pleasure horses. Any supposed inattention to these animals was sure to be visited with degrading punishment. His horses and dogs fared better than his men. Their beds must be softer and cleaner than those of his human cattle. No excuse could shield old Barney if the colonel only suspected something wrong about his horses, and consequently he was often punished when faultless. It was absolutely painful to listen to the many unreasonable and fretful scoldings poured out at the stable by Colonel Lloyd, his sons, and sons-in-law. Of the latter, he had three, Messrs. Nicholson, Winder, and Lowndes. These all lived at the great house a portion of the year, and enjoyed the luxury of whipping the servants when they pleased, which was by no means unfrequently. A horse was seldom brought out of the stable to which no objection could be raised. There was dust in his hair. There was a twist in his reins. His mane did not lie straight. He had not been properly grained. His head did not look well. His foretop was not combed out. His fetlocks had not been properly trimmed. Something was always wrong. Listening to complaints, however groundless, Barney must stand, hat in hand, lips sealed, never answering a word. He must make no reply, no explanation. The judgment of the master must be deemed infallible, for his power is absolute and irresponsible. In a free state, a master, thus complaining without cause of his ostler, might be told, Sir, I am sorry I cannot please you, but since I have done the best I can, your remedy is to dismiss me. Here, however, the ostler must stand, listen, and tremble. One of the most heart-saddening and humiliating scenes I ever witnessed was the whipping of old Barney by Colonel Lloyd himself. Here were two men, both advanced in years, 
There were the silvery locks of Colonel Lloyd, and there was the bald and toil-worn brow of old Barney, master and slave, superior and inferior here, but equals at the bar of God, and in the common course of events they must both soon meet in another world, in a world where all distinctions, except those based on obedience and disobedience, are blotted out forever. Uncover your head, said the imperious master. He was obeyed. Take off your jacket, you old rascal. And off came Barney's jacket. Down on your knees. Down knelt the old man, his shoulders bare, his bald head glistening in the sun, and his aged knees on the cold, damp ground. In this humble and debasing attitude, the master, that master to whom he had given the best years and the best strength of his life, came forward and laid on thirty lashes with his horse whip. The old man bore it patiently to the last, answering each blow with a slight shrug of the shoulders and a groan. I cannot think that Colonel Lloyd succeeded in marring the flesh of old Barney very seriously, for the whip was a light riding whip, but the spectacle of an aged man, a husband and a father, humbly kneeling before a worm of the dust, surprised and shocked me at the time, and since I have grown old enough to think on the wickedness of slavery, few facts have been of more value to me than this to which I was a witness. It reveals slavery in its true color, and in its maturity of repulsive hatefulness. I owe it to truth, however, to say that this was the first and the last time I ever saw old Barney, or any other slave, compelled to kneel to receive a whipping. I saw at the stable another incident, which I will relate, as it is illustrative of a phase of slavery to which I have already referred in another connection. Besides two other coachmen, Colonel Lloyd owned one named William, who, strangely enough, was often called by his surname, Wilkes, by white and colored people on the home plantation. Wilkes was a very fine-looking man. He was about as white as anybody on the plantation, and in manliness of form and comeliness of features, he bore a very striking resemblance to Mr. Murray Lloyd. It was whispered, and pretty generally admitted as a fact, that William Wilkes was a son of Colonel Lloyd by a highly favored slave woman who was still on the plantation. There were many reasons for believing this whisper, not only in William's appearance, but in the undeniable freedom which he enjoyed over all others, and his apparent consciousness of being something more than a slave to his master. It was notorious, too, that William had a deadly enemy in Murray Lloyd, whom he so much resembled, and that the latter greatly worried his father with importunities to sell William. Indeed, he gave his father no rest until he did sell him to Austin Woldfolk, the great slave trader at that time. Before selling him, however, Mr. Lloyd tried what giving William a whipping would do toward making things smooth, but this was a failure. It was a compromise and defeated itself, for, immediately after the infliction, the heart-sickened colonel atoned to William for the abuse by giving him a gold watch and chain. Another fact, somewhat curious, is that though sold to the remorseless wold folk, taken in irons to Baltimore and cast into prison, with a view of being driven to the south, William, by some means, always a mystery to me, outbid all his purchasers, paid for himself, and now resides in Baltimore, a free man. Is there not room to suspect that as the gold watch was presented to atone for the whipping, a purse of gold was given him by the same hand with which to effect his purchase as an atonement for the indignity involved in selling his own flesh and blood? All the circumstances of William on the great house farm 
show him to have occupied a different position from the other slaves, and certainly there is nothing in the supposed hostility of slaveholders to amalgamation to forbid the supposition that William Wilkes was the son of Edward Lloyd. Practical amalgamation is common in every neighborhood where I have been in slavery. Colonel Lloyd was not in the way of knowing much of the real opinions and feelings of his slaves respecting him. The distance between him and them was far too great to admit of such knowledge. His slaves were so numerous that he did not know them when he saw them, nor indeed did all his slaves know him. In this respect, he was inconveniently rich. It is reported of him that, While riding along the road one day, he met a colored man and addressed him in the usual way of speaking to colored people on the public highways of the South. Well, boy, who do you belong to? To Colonel Lloyd, replied the slave. Well, does the colonel treat you well? No, sir, was the ready reply. What, does he work you too hard? Yes, sir. Well, don't he give enough to eat? Yes, sir, he gives me enough such as it is. The colonel, after ascertaining where the slave belonged, rode on. The slave also went on about his business, not dreaming that he had been conversing with his master. He thought, said, and heard nothing more of the matter until two or three weeks afterwards. The poor man was then informed by his overseer that, for having found fault with his master, he was now to be sold to a Georgia trader. He was immediately chained and handcuffed, and thus without a moment's warning he was snatched away and forever sundered from his family and friends by a hand more unrelenting than that of death. This is the penalty of telling the simple truth in answer to a series of plain questions. It is partly in consequence of such facts that slaves when inquired of as to their condition and the character of their masters, almost invariably say they are contented and that their masters are kind. Slaveholders have been known to send spies among their slaves to ascertain, if possible, their views and feelings in regard to their condition. The frequency of this has had the effect to establish among the slaves the maxim that a still tongue makes a wise head. They suppress the truth rather than take the consequence of telling it, and in so doing they prove themselves a part of the human family. If they have anything to say of their master, it is generally something in his favor, especially when speaking to strangers. I was frequently asked, while a slave, if I had a kind master, and I do not remember ever to have given a negative reply, nor did I, when pursuing this course, consider myself as uttering what was utterly false, for I always measured the kindness of my master by the standard of kindness set up by slaveholders around us. However, slaves are like other people and imbibe similar prejudices. They are apt to think their condition better than that of others. Many, under the influence of this prejudice, think their own masters are better than the masters of other slaves, and this too in some cases when the very reverse is true. Indeed, it is not uncommon for slaves even to fall out and quarrel among themselves about the relative kindness of their masters, each contending for the superior goodness of his own over that of others. At the very same time, they mutually execrate their masters when viewed separately. It was so on our plantation. When Colonel Lloyd's slaves met those of Jacob Jepson, they seldom parted without a quarrel about their masters. Colonel Lloyd's slaves contending that he was the richest, and Mr. Jepson's slaves that he was the smartest man of the two. Colonel Lloyd's slaves would boast his ability to buy and sell Jacob Jepson. Mr. Jepson's slaves would boast his ability to whip Colonel Lloyd. These quarrels would almost always end in a fight between the parties. Those that beat 
were supposed to have gained the point at issue. They seemed to think that the greatness of their masters was transferable to themselves. To be a slave was thought to be bad enough, but to be a poor man's slave was deemed a disgrace indeed.